Welcome to Christ the King Church, Shelby, North Carolina. We're headed to the Psalm number 8 to open up our study this evening. And those of you that have joined us in your home, or wherever you might be, this is Thursday evening. This is Healing Rooms at Christ the King Church. So we welcome you to study along with us for the next uh, 30 minutes. In, the, in Psalms 8, they tell us David wrote this, so I don't know how he knew what he knew. But there were some truths that David had discovered that I think will be of help to us today if we can discover these same truths. He says beginning in verse 3, When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained. And then verse 4 he says, What is man? I hope you have those words underscored in your Bible. What is man? That thou art mindful of him, and the son of man, that thou visitest him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels. And we learn the original Hebrew, it's Elohim, it's God. Most of your modern translations would translate this word God. But it's translated angels in the King James. And he crowned him with glory and honor. Thou hast made him to have dominion. And that's a key word for David. I don't know how God revealed to David about this dominion thing. But notice what he said. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands... And thou hast put all things under his feet. David knew something here about the original creation that we've just touched on some. The word dominion is only found in Genesis chapter 1. It's not found in Genesis chapter 2. I thought that was interesting because it shows me that David understood something about creation that most believers today have never understood. He uses this word dominion. He talked about man being created by God and that he was made, and the word made and the word created are the same words in the Hebrew, made him to be a little lower than Elohim, God, crowned him with glory and with honor. In Genesis chapter 1, I'm not going to spend a lot of time there just to refresh your thinking. Genesis chapter 1. The Bible said God created man in his own image and after his own likeness. Then it says he created him male and female together, same time. And we call this the spiritual creation. God spoke something into existence. And he did that out of nothing. There was nothing. When God created the heavens and the earth and God created man, there was nothing. That's why the Hebrew word is called bara. But when you come to chapter 2, it's a different creation. There's a lot of confusion that needs to be cleared here. When you get into Genesis chapter 2, the Bible said God created Adam, and then of course he put him to sleep and took Eve out of his side. That's not what Genesis 1 said. Genesis chapter 1 says Elohim, God, did the creating. But when you get to chapter 2, is changed to Jehovah. 
Now, I'm not saying they're different gods. I'm just saying the names were changed. The word created in chapter 1 is entirely different than the word formed in chapter 2. It doesn't say that God created man in chapter 2. It says God formed man out of the dust of the earth. In t two different documents all together trying to tell us about the creation. Now, of course, we've been taught that it's the same thing. It's just chapter 2 is actually telling us how God created man. No, that's not true. If it had been the same thing, then it would use the same words. The Bible said he created in chapter 1, but he formed in chapter 2. That's why I call chapter 1 a spiritual creation. But chapter 2 is not a spiritual creation. Chapter 2, God is making man out of material. He's making him out of the dust of the earth. He's making him a mud man. He's breathing the breath of life. That doesn't happen in chapter 1. So in chapter 1, there's only one God. There's only one voice, and there's only one power. When you move into chapter 2, there's another voice now that has entered the earth. I call it the snake talker. We don't find him in chapter 1. There's no sin in chapter 1. There's no sickness in chapter 1. There's no death in chapter 1. It's just blessing. And the Bible said when God created all that, those things in chapter 1, he looked at it and he says, it's very good. But when you get to chapter 2, the whole story changes. Something now has entered into the earth that was not there in the spiritual creation. There, there, there's another voice. There's another authority. There's another power. There's lies. There's temptation. And what happens now is there are some people that are actually believing this other voice now that's in the earth and then out of that comes sin and sickness and death, disease, pain, worry, frustration, shame, and all this comes out of chapter 2. So what God is trying to say to us is you need to make you a choice where you're going to live in chapter 1 or chapter 2. Well, if you were like me, when you came into this earth, we came into this earth with all kind of false things taught us. We heard that original sin stuff. That's not even found in scriptures. There's no such word as original sin found in scripture. But see, something had to happen to us to get us back into Genesis chapter 1. And there's where 2 Corinthians 5.17 comes to the forefront. When Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, there was a new creation began. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. The word creation in the Greek is not creature, it's creation. He's a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And we have learned through these studies that uh, this new creation gets us back into Genesis 1. It gets us back into the image and likeness of God that we supposedly had lost. And now we're back, even Warren Wiersbe the pastor of Moody Church, used to be, Warren Wiersbe says that God did more than that. He not only restored us back to what Adam lost, he took back and put us back where Adam was before he ever sinned. Think about that. There's no way you could have ever made Adam feel guilty of sin in chapter 1 of Genesis. There was no sin there. Yet the world today is eat up with sin and guilt and shame and condemnation. Sin conscious instead of Christ conscious. And we wonder why we have the problems that we're having. Can somebody say amen? amen. amen. I, I mentioned something last night that just I thought of. I have, I have a tree on the edge of my driveway. It's an oak tree. 
Matter of fact, I have several of them around my property. This particular tree is very unusual. In October, when the leaves turn and begin to fall, the leaves on this tree don't fall. The leaves on this tree will be on that tree all the way through winter. In the springtime, when the sap begins to rise, and something new is beginning to form, there's a new life coming forth now in these branches, and the new leaves are being formed, guess what happens to the old ones? They fall off. But not until the new leaves are being formed. Bring that over into our thinking. I don't care how much you pray for people. I don't care how many hands are laid upon people. I don't care how much oil is poured upon a person. Until that person is beginning to be infused with this new life, and I call it truth, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and it begins to come up within them, mm -hmm. then this infusion of truth of who God is and who we are, those truths begin to just settle up inside of us and something begins to grow. We're putting on the new man and we're putting off the old man. And what happens is sin, sickness, disease, pain, these things begin to fall away because they've been replaced with the new stuff. And that's what we call, the Bible calls it having your mind renewed. Paul called it let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It's having the mind of Christ. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Amen. Christ is in us. Is there any sickness in Christ? No. Any death in Christ? No. None at all. Jesus said, if you believe in me, you'll never die. Amen. Shoot, I'm just stupid enough, I guess, to believe that. I don't know. I just, <laughs> that's what he said in his word. Now, this is the thing that I'm coming to grips with. I can never, as a teacher of the Bible, I can never control what happens in a congregation. I don't know who's listening. I don't know who has ears to hear. I don't know who's hearing. I don't know who's ready to receive this revelation that's coming forth. I don't know who's opening up to receive. I just don't know. But see, when the word goes forth, the ability to change is there. That does not mean that everybody's going to change. Everybody didn't get healed under the ministry of Jesus. Everybody didn't become Christians as they listened to Paul's teachings. But the thing about it is, see, you never know who or you never know when someone is ready. And the thing about it is, usually the guys that are ready are the ones that are less educated. I've been to Guatemala. I've been to Russia. I've been to Mexico. I've been to Africa. And I've seen illiterate people hear the word of the Lord and bam! We saw it in Russia. Well, it's just like you preach the word of the Lord to people who have not heard the gospel in 70 years. And the stadium is filled. And they're just sitting there stone faced. And then you begin to wonder, oh Lord, are they receiving the word of the Lord? You see what happens? Faith comes when they hear the word of the Lord. And then... When we give an invitation, you better get out of the way. It's just like God throws a net over that crowd. And here they come. Can I get an amen, amen, Mel? They almost stampeded her trying to get to the front where we're going to pray for people. So a lot of people are just too smart. My daddy used to say, that boy there is too smart for his own britches. I never did know really what that meant, but I think I do a little bit now. But don't ever get set in stone. Uh, Pastor Miles, Evangelical Cathedral in Spartanburg, many, many years ago when I was still in my denominational church, he and I, he counseled with me one day and he said, Vernon, 
don't ever get set in cement. He said, if you do, you're going to break. Because the word of the Lord is going to begin to change you and you're going to begin to bend. And if you can't move, it's going to break you as you stand right there. Don't ever think that you've got it all settled. Amen. I've been to three seminaries and I'm just as spiritually ignorant today in God's sight as I was then. I never stop studying. I never stop seeking the Lord. If you come into my house, where's Vernon? He's downstairs. I'm down seeking the Lord. I'm down studying. Those of you that are Sunday school teachers, bless God, don't wait till Friday to go over the lesson. Do you know what I do on Sunday afternoon? Before I retire Sunday night, I'm before God, I'm trying to get a word for this next coming Lord's Day because I don't study for sermons, I seek the word of the Lord. I'm trying to get a word. Where are we going to go next Sunday? I don't wait till Friday or Saturday to do that. You've got to show God that I want a word. I want to be taught by you. And that's why when he asked me several months back, he said, what? What do you think about 2 Corinthians 5.17? I said, I, uh, hmm. I knew it's a setup. When God asked me a question, I've learned not to try to answer. I've learned to say, well, sir, I really don't know, but I'd really be pleased if you'd teach me. Don't act like you know it. You might think you know it. But you really might not know it. So just act like you don't know a lot. And uh, people won't expect a lot out of you. We heard that from a man one time, didn't we? <laughs> oh boy, used to come to church and he said, you know, if you act like you don't know a lot, people won't expect a lot out of you. <laughs> and it didn't. He died. We had to bury him. We had to pay for his funeral. But <laughs> anyway, I meet people who are too smart. And they always, uh, they, they want to argue too much. You know? We're not here to argue. We're just trying to teach the word. But this is what I'm saying. Once the word goes out, and it's working out there, faith comes by hearing. Anytime the word is being taught, faith is there. Something is working in the atmosphere. And see, now, once the word goes out, it's between the word and that individual. How is that individual receiving what's being said? You know, you can stop it any minute you want to. Cut your mind off. Go on up to the radio shack. Just, just leave us for a while. But uh, I always say, take your mind back. Say, take your mind back. <laughs> Luke chapter 5. There's a couple passages here that I'd like to read to you. But Jesus said, if any man have ears, let him hear. I read that and I said, well, dear Lord, we all have two. But see, he's not talking about the physical ears. You see, faith doesn't come with what you hear with these physical ears. God is a spirit. The word is spirit. Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they're spirit in their life. The word is spirit. And you have another set of ears too. We'll call them spiritual ears. If you ever remember the first time you got the little cassette out and you had your little mic and you recorded something on that cassette and then you plugged it, play, and listen. You said, dear Lord, who's that? That's not me. Sure it is. Sure it's you. But you're hearing it now differently. Are you with me? You're actually hearing it now with a different set of ears. It's coming in here. When I'm talking now, it's coming up from here. Are we okay? Amen. So he that has ears to hear, let him hear. And see, the problem with the teacher, you don't know who, who, who are those that have ears out there. So that's why I'm telling you, we can't control what happens. We can't control who gets healed. We can't control who gets saved. We can't control any of this thing. It's God working now. God has to touch and call and choose. These kind of, all kind of things are happening when the word of the Lord is being preached. Can you say amen? Luke chapter 5, I want to read verse 15 first. 5.15 But so much the more that there went a fame abroad of him 
a great multitude, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Isn't that an awesome thought? They came to hear and to be healed. Verse 17. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees, doctors of law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And this is what I want to say here. They came to hear and to be healed. He was teaching. And the Bible said the power of the Lord was present to heal them. So anytime the word of the Lord is being taught, the power of the Lord is present to heal you. Amen. Without anybody touching you, without anybody putting oil on you, the power of the Lord is present to heal you when that truth is going forth. But you never know where that truth is going to settle. You don't know who's ready for it. You don't know who's open to it. But I'm telling you, when that truth begins to come into your life, the old leaves, the old stuff, the old things just begin to fall away. Amen. And something new begins to come up inside of you. Are we okay? Amen. Matthew chapter 13. A couple of verses I want to read. Matthew 13, we're going to do verse 14 first. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah says Isaiah, well Isaiah, which saith by hearing you shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. So I just want to put the wisdom of the Lord in you that when you come to hear a person like me or any other called Bible teacher, put your ears on. Take your mind back. Bring it in with you. Sit. Listen. You're in the presence of the Lord. The power of the Lord is present to heal you. Anything can happen. Because whatever you're, is clinging on to you now, that can just fall off. Glory to God. As truth begins to work its way into you. Are we okay with that understanding? So, in a time of need, we're going to Psalms 103. In a time of need, can you really depend upon God to help you? Yes. The same guy who did Psalms 8 also did Psalms 103. Same, same man. David, and I want to know how David knew this stuff. Where did he get his information from? Psalms 103 verse 1, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Now notice the word benefits. David is about to write some of these benefits. First of all, he forgiveth all of thy iniquities. Or he forgives all my sins. Would you say that? Forgives all my sins. And heals all thy diseases. Say heals all my diseases. 
fourth verse, he says, he redeems your life from destruction. Why don't you just say that? He redeems my life from destruction. He redeems my life from destruction. And then he says, he crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. Why don't you just confess that? He crowns me with loving kindness and tender mercies. I like verse 5. He satisfies your mouth with good things. Better than that. My youth is being renewed like the eagles. So praise God, my youth is being renewed. Yeah, look down at verse 10. He has not dealt with us after our sins. I say praise God for that. <laughs> he has not dealt with us after our sins, nor has he rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is higher above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. I like verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. There's no time that east and west ever meet. If you start going east, Daylight in the morning, you'll still be going east. Mm -hmm. The east and the west never meet. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible says that's how far he's taken our sins away from us, I just say amen to that. Amen. Praise God. The, uh, the NIV says this, He does not tr treat us as our sins deserve. I don't see any halos around anybody's head, so I must be preaching to us. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. Thank God for that. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Praise God. So when he forgives our sin, the Bible said he separates those sins from us. And he doesn't even remember them. Why do we want to hang on to them? Why do we want to remember them? The Bible said he never remembers them again. So never fear your ugly past. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Because God's wiped the record clean. That's what the cross did. That's the purpose of the blood of Christ. If we can handle it without it, he never would have come to earth. We'd just, we'd just kept tied up our lip and do the best we can and hope we get in. No, see, we couldn't do that. So he came, paid a price for our sin. He paid a debt that he really didn't know. He paid a debt that he didn't know. We was the one that owed the debt. But praise the Lord, these things have been taken away from. I'm talking about the new creation. And I'm telling you, this guy named, this guy named David here. What did David know when he wrote this stuff? Do you ever think about that? I try to project myself into the minds of these people that were writing this. Why was he so sure that God could do all these things? Forgive all your sins. Heal all your diseases. Redeems you from destruction. Crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Let your youth be renewed like an eagle. How did he know God does all of these things? Is it possible that David himself had experienced some of these things? Do you realize David was a murderer? Do you realize he was an adulterer? David committed adultery. David committed murder. But there's only one thing in the Bible said about David that's never said about another man. He was a man after God's own heart. And God said that. God said that. This is what God said in Acts 13, 22. He said, I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Glory to God. That's the NIV version of course. He'll do everything I want him to do. A man after God's own heart. That is an awesome thought because God never said that about another man. 
So when you think, you got to get your halo. And you think you got to get all your ducks in a row. And you just got to get your act together. Then, by the grace of God, God might use you. <laughs> All of those things that's listing in Psalms 103, you do not deserve one of them. You don't deserve one of them. That's why that loving kindness and tender mercies is coming there. Whatever we get from God is because God graced us. Not because we deserve it. Not because we... It, he just graced us. He's a good God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So, was David just writing? Or had he had some kind of experiences with God where he was able to say, hey, I know how God created us. Psalms 8, I know how God created us. He gave us dominion. We rule over all things. And then he gets over into Psalms 3 and he talks about all of these things that God is doing for us. The question for all of us, I think, is do you know that power that David was talking about? Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Do you know that power that's higher than human power? Yes. And can actually heal us of whatever, I call it evil, we encounter. Amen. Amen. The idea of God's healing powers runs all the way through the Bible. Yes. I remember the story of Miriam. Her brother Moses married a black girl. Mm -hmm. He wasn't black. He was a white boy. Mm -hmm. But he married an Ethiopian. He married a black girl. Mm -hmm. Miriam didn't like that. She started murmuring about that. She got very critical of Moses. And all at once, bless God, she was filled with leprosy. This is Numbers chapter 11 or 12. So God had to talk to Miriam a little bit and said, listen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I just talked to a lot of other people. I talked to Moses face to face. And said, you didn't, hear me. You didn't come here and shut your mouth off and you passed judgment. You pass judgment on your brother because he married an Ethiopian and said, this stuff has come on you. Mm -hmm. Moses prayed for her. Yes. In the very moment he prayed for her, God healed her. Yes. It runs all the way through the Bible. Mm -hmm. I tell people here, best thing you can do, just zip it up. Ooh. They people who come here, I don't approve of. Mm -hmm. It's not my church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not my church. Mm -hmm. I'm just a teacher here in the church. Mm -hmm. I'm not the head of the church. Mm -hmm. It's not my church. There's a lot of things going here that I don't like. Mm -hmm. It's not my church. And I'm just going to tell you, if God's not big enough to straighten it out, don't call on me, Lord. All But see, when you start moving into these critical attitudes, and when you start moving into these judgmental spirits, if you're not careful, Amen. you're cutting yourself off from the healing virtues of God, and you'll find yourself on the outside trying to look back in. Amen. I don't know about you, I need the favor of God in my life. I want His mercy. I want His grace. When I, I, want, I want all my sins forgiven. I want all my diseases healed. And that gummit, I just don't want to do anything that's going to hinder what God's wanting to do in my life. Can you say amen? So I think when, uh, I think there are things that we need to understand about God that, uh, that would make healing possible for us. I don't know how much time I have, but let me just hit. Are you timing me, brother? Yeah. Okay. Let me just hit a couple things. There's some questions that you need to ask and maybe know about God. We're talking about how to be healed now. Number one, get rid of the distorted views of God. We all have views that have been distorted about God. I don't know. God is good and God is love. I want you to write that down. 
we're getting rid of the distorted views that we have of God. This is how you this is how truth heals you. This is what happens when you receive and believe that God is good and he's a God of love. God loves me. The second thing I want you to know is God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the life. So truth is alive. It's something that's living. God is truth. God created me in his image. God created me in his image. Now, let me move you. This new creation you become. Let me help us repent and get back into Genesis 1. And that's why I say this. God is the only power in the earth. In Genesis chapter 1, there was no other voices. There was no other power except I'm helping you now to get healed. God is the only power in the earth. God only blesses his creation. That's why the Bible said in Genesis 1, he blessed them. Be fruitful, multiply. And he said, hey, it's very good. So he blesses his creation. God does not curse, nor does he punish his creation. And surely he never curses or punishes his creation with diseases or he would not say, I'm the Lord, I heal all your diseases. Amen. He didn't put something on you one day and heal it the next day. Amen. Another thing I want to say to you is this. When you see these truths, the things that are not of God will begin to lift off of you. When you see these truths, the things that are not of God will just begin to lift off of you because these truths are pushing the old way of thinking, the old life off of you, and something new now is beginning to enter. When truth is entering, things begin to change. I call it error. Wrong views, lies, disease, fear, anxiety, worry, they just fall off. You don't know what happened to it, it just falls off. You just don't think the same like you were thinking before. Now, the word of the Lord for you right here now is, I want you to refuse to believe anything that is not true about God. Refuse to believe anything that's not true about God. When you're sick and somebody says, God put that on you, say, eh, reject. Don't listen, don't believe it, and don't receive it. So I'm asking you to refuse to believe anything that is not true about God. Don't you let anybody make you into believing a lie. I don't care how smart they are. It doesn't matter how much education they have. I don't care how big their church is. I don't care how big their building is. Don't you ever let anybody make you to believe a lie. Because a lie comes from only one source. Genesis 1. There was no liar. There was no voice there except God. But when you get in Genesis chapter 2, you get exposed to this other voice. And if you want to follow that other voice, I can tell you, it's going to be a rough ride as you go through this life. So, this truth that we're hearing about and this truth that we're trying to, to pour in, I, I use the word meditation. Let me tell you how that works. Today I went for my physical therapy. And I was put through one hour and 30 minutes of moaning and groaning. <laughs> but I had to sit out front 
about 20 minutes to wait to get in there. Now, it was very quiet. Do you know what I did? For 20 minutes, I sat there, and this is what I said. God is good. God is good. God is good. God's good. What are you doing, Pastor? I'm meditating. God's good. God's good. God's good. You sit around and say that for four or five years. <laughs> and then when somebody tells you, well, God put that mess on you, you say, that's a lie out of hell. Because you done programmed yourself into believing God's good. And if God's good, God ain't going to put none of that mess on you. God is good. For 20 minutes I said that. God's good. And two ladies in there, one of them was a therapist and the other was a secretary. They were waiting on me when I finished my workout. Can we talk to you about something? I said, oh yeah. I'm trying to decide if I'm going to get married or not. Here we went 15 minutes with her. And this lady said, I go to a church over here in Kings Mountain. It's the big church, you know. I'm going over there. But said, I haven't been in a while. Oh, for you. So I spent 30 minutes there and I said, okay, ladies, this is the way it is. Both of you will get a bill from me next month. I said, my time's just as valuable as y'all's are up here. I said, y'all bill Medicare for me being up here. I'm going to bill y'all for me being here. <laughs> but what are you doing? Do you know what's setting me up for that? God is good. God is good. God is good. God is good. I just sat out there for about 20 minutes. That's all I said. I didn't confess scripture. I just said, God's good. And what are you trying to do? Bless God, I'm trying to convince myself. I want to have the confidence in here that God is good. That's why when you read in Genesis 1, God looked and he said, everything's very good. A good God makes very good stuff. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. So, you need to spend time learning what is true about God. About his being, about his nature, who he is. And then, be faithful to the truth you know. That's just as important. Be faithful to the truth that you know. Like the goodness of our creator. God is the only creator. There's not another. God's the only creator. God is good. God is love. There's no punishment in that love. God did not create me to suffer, to be destroyed. Find yourself as God knows you. Find yourself as God sees you. See yourself as being reborn, recreated, back in the image of God. Back even beyond where Adam was when he was created. With the past wiped away. See the spiritual qualities that God has put inside of you. You're spiritually minded. That means you have life and peace. <coughs> spiritual minded people have life and peace. Carnal minded people have death. But thank God for the life. Can you say amen? So, uh, I asked a person the other day, I'm studying the life of a person who was probably the first healing lady that God ever raised up. And what amazed me was people would just get in her presence and be healed. I mean, she wouldn't say anything, just get in her presence. And I, I was talking to an old saint of God. God only knows how old she was. I said, what was the key to that lady's life? You see, when there are people like that, I want to learn all I can about them. If it's possible to get in the presence of a person and be healed without them touching or saying, I want to know something about that person. This is what she told me. She had a pure mind. Amen. That hasn't got away from me yet. I came home and asked Barb. I said, Barb, I said, what do you think a pure mind is? A pure mind. A pure mind. I'll let you meditate that. Ask God what a pure mind is. 
Because as you minister to people, you need to have a pure mind. She didn't use the word clean. She used the word pure. Pure mind. And you know in the parable of the sower, there were, there were things, deceitfulness of riches, lust of other things cares of this world. To me, that's going to contaminate your mind. Keeps you from being pure. So I'm just, I just want to put the word in you tonight. I'm challenging you. Discover how you can have a pure mind. And I really don't know how. But I'm going to do it because I've asked God. Because I want to see people healthy. I want to see people hail, uh, helped. So now, let me, these, some of these things you hear, you listen to the tape and all this, you took notes, but these are things that have to be poured in you every day. Yes. yes. This is not something that just got you, grabbed you, glory to God, I got it. No, it has to go over. Faith comes by hearing. Yeah, hearing. hearing and hearing. It's a continuous action verb in the Greek. Hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. You must continue. Go over these truths. Get them into your mind. Renew your mind. Let them become a part of your spirit being. And then when you hear, well, God's doing this and God's doing that, you just say, no, God's good. God's good. Because you've got it ingrained in you. But see, just because I sat there today for 20 minutes and said that, that doesn't mean three months from now I'm going to have it. I've got to continue to pour these things in. And as I continue to pour in the truths of God, as I continue to pour inside of me these revelational truths, things begin to fall away. Things begin to fall away. And before long, you'll find yourself free. Truth shall make you free. And it just works automatically. Truth just works automatically. I just picked up the tail end this past week of Charles Stanley teaching on truth. i got to try to pull that up and see what he said about it. But what I heard, I liked. Well, he's a pretty good Bible teacher. But uh, he, he's dealing with this truth stuff too. I said, well, praise God. He's hearing from the Holy Ghost. I know that. But uh, uh, let, me, let me end with you today in Isaiah 45. Let me, let me give you this passage. I like this passage. Isaiah 45. So these truths, as they're being poured into you, will certainly transform your life. Isaiah 45, uh, verse 21. Found it? Verse 21 says, Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who has declared this from ancient time? Who has told it from that time? Have not I the Lord? And there is no God else beside me. I want you to just know that I wasn't shooting a breeze when I told you there's only one God. Now, I don't care what Paul said about the devil being the God of this world. He's not the God of the world I live in. He might have been my God for the first 25 years, but by God, he ain't my God now. Amen. So I'll read this latter part of this verse. Notice what he said to you. There is no God else beside me. Can you say amen? amen. Next verse. A just God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Verse 22. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. God, he's not told me that three times. <laughs> Verse 23, I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return, that unto me every knee shall bow, and every tongue shall Swear or confess. Three times. He says here. There is no God. Besides me. I am God. And there is. No one else. 
Isn't that good? Amen. Isn't that good? It really bothered some people. When I made the statement, I don't believe in devils. <laughs> you don't believe in devils? No. I believe they exist, but I don't have faith in them. When I say I believe in devils, I'm just saying I have faith in devils. I believe in devils. I have faith in devils. No, I don't. I have faith in God. I have faith in God. Somebody said on oh, me last week, what are we supposed to do about the devil? Ignore him. <laughs> it's ignore the dude. He can't handle that. Amen. He wants you to give him attention. Yeah. He wants you to preach about him. He wants you to brag about all the powers and abilities he has. He wants you to blow him up and magnify him. He wants you to make a strong voice out of him. He's a liar. He's been defeated. Jesus paralyzed him. It's over. He's history. Don't believe and put your faith and trust in devils for God's sakes. Don't give the devil your dominion that God gave you. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? amen? Sit and just focus. God, I serve. That's all there is. He's all I need. Hallelujah. One God. One power. One voice. And there. We know where our help comes from. Our help comes from the Lord. Those of you that have watched us, if you'd like some more of this teachings, it's available to you. You just contact our church office. And I pray the goodness of God upon your life. In Jesus' name, amen.